Hello and welcome to Fellowship at Home. We are so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Angela and I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Angela, it's so good to be with you. Well, it's good to be here with you. Yeah, I love it. My yes. name is Johnny. I'm one of the pastors here as well. And I'm excited for today. We're going to hear an incredible, incredible word. Mm -hmm. We're going to have an amazing time engaging together. But we don't want it just to be for us. There are so many people out there right now right. that you have influence over and with that we would love to invite to the service time together. So we want to ask you right now, share, share, share. Wherever you're watching this, share. There's an opportunity to share and we want to invite you to do just that because someone needs some hope someone needs some encouragement today. Here at Fellowship, uh, we are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church, and there is one reason, reason we exist, and that is? To make disciples. That is what we exist to do. Um, we make disciples through living lives of gathering together in community just like this. Um, and right now, one of the things that we also do as a part of a family of faith is we lament the things that need to be lamented and we celebrate the things that need to be celebrated. But right now in the state of our country, we know that there are some heartbreaking things happening from coast to coast. Here in California, we've got wildfires that are raging. For our brothers and sisters in the South, Hurricane Laura uh, that just swept through the land and, and created devastation there. Those are things that are heartbreaking. And so we just wanna take a moment and say to our brothers and sisters, we see you, we love you, we are with you. Um, just know that we are praying for you as you navigate um, all of these different natural disasters. We have not forgot, and we, there's no way we can forget of the racial injustice that continues to plague our country. As you said, from coast to coast, our hearts just break as we continue to hear there's report after report after report of our sisters and our brothers of color um, experiencing this racial injustice. So we as a church, we are committed to fight from the knees of prayer and also stand up and act out as God leads us, that God can bring healing to this land. That's right. So right now we wanna just take some time to pray. We wanna just come before our Lord and just ask him to intercede. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you now to this space. God, we just thank you for being who you are, that you are a great, big, mighty God. Lord, we know that none of this has caught you by surprise, Lord God, and we know that you have made a way, that you have prepared a way, Lord God, for us to navigate these extremely trying times. Lord, from everything, from natural disasters to racial injustice, God, we know that you care about it all. Nothing, God, is outside of what your heart cares about. And we're so thankful for that, Lord. So Lord, would you just cover us right now? Would you provide for our brothers and sisters who are experiencing devastation on any level? Lord, would you comfort the hearts that are broken? Lord, would you be near to them? We thank you, God, that you are God who keeps his promises and you've promised that you draw near to the brokenhearted. So right now, Lord, we come before you as humbly as we know how. Lord, asking that you would just continue to have your way, cover, be near, make yourself so evident, Lord God, so you show yourself strong. It's in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. Amen. Fellowship, we know that we worship in a bunch of different ways. We worship through prayer. We worship through hearing God's word. And right now we want to invite you to a time of worship through song. So whether you're on your couch, whether on your phone, wherever you are, Fellowship family, uh, let's take some time and let's worship together.
Hey, Fellowship family, I am um, so excited to once again open up God's word together um, as we sit and as we're shaped uh, by these eternal words, the power of God's word in just this moment together, just while we're here together in these next few moments, eternity can change. Lives can be transformed. Destiny shifted by one word from God. So I hope you come with some anticipation. I hope you come ready, expectant for God to move, for God to speak, because guess what? That's what he always does. Luke 18 is where we're going to invite the spirit of the living God to speak to us today as we're in the final installment of our series, Hold On. Hold on. We've been holding on for three weeks now. This is week four. Hold on. I hope you've been encouraged. Um, and I hope you, you see vision and see hope of what it means for you to hold on in this season. Well, Luke 18 is one of my favorite passages. Um, it, it's, a, it's another anchor text for me, uh, and it shapes me so significantly. Um, it's, it's the one about the rich young ruler. Hear these words of our father, Luke 18, verse 18. Here we go. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You should not commit adultery. You should not murder. You should not steal. You shall uh, not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. You know, all these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad hmm. because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this ask, who then can be saved? Can't you hear that? They hear that. It's like, this guy can't get in. We in trouble. Who can get in? Because they were so impressed by his wealth. Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for your words and how they have the power to shape us. Now, Father, would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly, turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. Oh Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Honestly, I, I, I wrestle with this often. The words spoken over my life by a mentor, they, um, to say they haunt me is to, is to use strong language, but to be honest, that's how I feel it. That, that's really how I feel it. He, he said, out when, I, when I was getting started, he said, Albert, be careful when it comes to ministry. I, I've said this many times before. He says, Albert, be careful when it comes to ministry. Um, there's a dangerous side to ministry. I, I said, what's that? He says, when you start traveling, when you start doing it, when you get a couple of years under your belt, when you start, when you, when you just... He says, just be careful, Albert. There's a dangerous side to ministry. I said, what's the dangerous side to ministry? He said, the dangerous side to ministry is you can learn how to do it. He said, you can, you can get enough hours in. You, you get enough experience under your belt and you just learn how to do it. You get good at it. My concern is that not only that I learn how to do it, but I lose what it is to be it. Because inevitably, ministry isn't something that you do. It has to flow from someone that you be. 
Ministry is not an assignment that you do. It has to flow. It has to come authentically from someone that you be, who you become. Ministry flows out of your being. My prayer and my hope, and I want to put this before all of us today, be careful. Christianity has a dangerous side to it. We can learn how to do it and fail to be it. Christianity, there's a dangerous side because we can learn how to do Christian things, learn how to do Christian acts. We can learn how to do it and fail to be it. Same thing with church. We always talk about everybody talking about church in this pandemic. What does it mean for the church? We're not meeting together. We're not gathering together. What's going on? We, because some of us, we see church as something that we do. It's a place we go to. It's, a, it's, a, it's an hour and a half experience on Sunday morning. It is never what the church was called to be. Everybody's making a big deal about being able to gather in buildings. You know, the first hundred years, it wasn't no church buildings of the church of Jesus Christ. They didn't gather, in, 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 they, didn't, they didn't have churches with pews and, 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 and worship teams and all that. This, is, this came hundreds of years later. The church can thrive and be who the church is called to be without a steeple and without pews. Today, I want to talk about this idea of holding on. And what we need to hold on is our mission, who we've been called to be. And resist the temptation to be consumed with what are we supposed to do? What do we do as Christians? What do we do as a church? What do I do as a pastor? What do I do in ministry? It's not about what you do. It's about who you be. Hold on to the very essence of the mission that God has called you. And your mission is about your being, not your doing. We are to be followers of Jesus Christ. We are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We are to be. We are human beings, not human doings. Hold on to your mission, to your purpose, to your identity, who God has called you to be. I feel like a coach today. I'm a pill. I want to pull you by your chest, but not by your chest, by your shirt, by your lapel. There you go. I'll pull you by your lapel and, and bring you close and say, it's not about your doing in this season. It's about your being. Our church is not about our, our gathering. It's about our being. What good is our gathering if our gathering doesn't result into being? I want us to hold on to the mission. I want to revisit what does it mean to be on mission for Jesus. What is our mission? What does it mean to be Christian for Jesus? What does it mean to be the church of Jesus Christ in this season? Because I'm concerned. We are talking a lot about what we're supposed to do as a church. And I think we need to be reminded about who we're supposed to be as a church. It's a lot of talk about what we're supposed to do as Christians. The question is, especially as we come into a Political season, pandemic, crisis, uprising, racial unrest. The question ain't what are we supposed to do. The question is who you're supposed to be because your being will shape your doing every time. You get the being right, you'll get the doing right. But if you get the doing and don't get the being, then what you're doing is not authentically showing up out of who you are. That, my friends, called hypocrisy. The rich young ruler, he's a great case study for this kind of conversation. He's a great case, case study because he knew, he knew what he was supposed to be. He knew it. He knew what he was supposed to be. That's why he came to Jesus. He came to Jesus saying, what must I do to follow you? Because my job is supposed to fo- I'm supposed to fo- be a follower of Jesus Christ. That's who I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a follower of you. So what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to be on your team? What must I do to be with you? And the conversation culminates with an invitation. Jesus looks at him and says, come, be with me, follow me. Come, be a disciple. Come on, come come with my journey. But the story ends with him walking away from Jesus. How did he get off mission? How did he get off the purpose that he went intentionally, went to Jesus to try to go acquire? How is it that he get invited to fulfill his life's mission and his story ends with him walking away from Jesus? How does this happen? How do you get off mission so drastically? How do you end up walking the wrong way with your life, with your purpose, with your mission? How do you miss, here it is, holding on to your mission? How do you miss it? How do you miss it? I'd argue today, that you miss it first with your eyes. You miss it with your eyes. He didn't didn't see his identity in Christ. 
He saw his identity in the status of this world. He missed it with his eyes. He missed it. He didn't see his identity in Christ. He saw his identity and his status in the world. Listen to how we describe him. We don't even know his name. Listen to what we call him. Rich, young, ruler. Status, status, status. Rich, young, ruler. That's how he saw himself. That's how the world saw him. That's how the Bible saw him. They described him by his status according to this world. Be careful. You will not stay on mission if your eyes are more focused on your status in this world and not focus on your status as a follower of Jesus Christ. Before I'm anything else, I'm a follower. My identity is in Christ and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. He missed it. Because his status was more than his calling. I'll say that again. He missed it. His status was worth more than his calling. Jesus literally called him. Jesus says, come on, come, come follow me. But he looked at his status and he recognized that in order to accept the calling of Christ, it would threaten his status in this world. So he opted for status over Christ as opposed to Christ over status. Oh, I'm teaching up in here today. Are y'all with me up in here? So, so, so he opted for status in this world and not status in Christ. You know the story. Yeah, I, I just read. I just read. But he says, teacher, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to, to, to get it? To get it. So first of all, Jesus says, why do you call me good? You know not as good, but God. That's Jesus' way of saying, I know that you know that I know that you know that you know that I know that I'm God. You ain't talking to some regular rabbi. Nah, we both know that you know that you're talking to God because you call me good teacher. And we both know that you've tried religion and it hadn't satisfied you. So we both know that you lack something because the only reason why you sitting here asking me the question is because you already know the answer. You know that you lack something. So he, it's clear, I lack something. Jesus knows that, that, I, that you lack something. So Jesus says, all right, here's the deal. Rich, young ruler, sell everything that you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. He saw the invitation, but he saw his status and he wasn't willing to let go of one so that he might receive the other. You wanna stay on mission? You wanna hold on to your mission? May your eyes find and focus, may your eyes focus, may your eyes focus on your identity in Christ and in who Christ is. And may your eyes not get distracted by the other things, the other statuses, the other things, the distractions of this world to where you miss around and you start following the wrong thing. You start following the wrong identity. You start following, you focus on the wrong thing. Because if you focus on the wrong thing, you can miss the faithful God that is calling you to something greater. Get your focus. If you're going to stay on mission, you got to stay on focus. You can't be distracted by the counterfeits of this world. My mentor Brian Loritz sent me a great um, <laughs> sent me a text message. Gave it. He he was telling me about zebras. Did you know this? I didn't know this about zebras. Zebras stripes are like our fingerprints. There are no two stripes alike. Every zebra has its own pattern. Has its own fingerprint, if you will. Every stripe is its own unique place. No two zebras have them in the same place. Therefore, when a newborn zebra uh, arrives in the world for the first two weeks, the mother of that zebra would get right in the zebra's face. It get, get right in his face. It, get, it gets right in, and it gets right in the face. It gets right in the face of the zebra, and it stays there for like two weeks. It just stays there, stays there. So that the zebra can get so familiar with the stripes and the pattern of his mother, he will be able to identify it wherever he goes. This keeps him because if this doesn't happen, he finds himself susceptible that when they're in a herd, when they're out, he could get lost by following any old zebra. 
do you see, if you get it early, I'm gonna have the preachers long. If y'all come, come on, y'all, y'all, y'all see me coming, you got it, go, come on. If you got, if you got a comment section, just go ahead and start putting zebras in the comment section. Put zebras in the comment section. Here's the point. I'm telling you, we've got to get so familiar, so attuned to God's pattern, to his pattern, to where he is. We got to get so attuned to it so we won't get distracted by any old pattern of this world, by any old stripe of this world. The rich young ruler, he got the wrong path. He started following the wrong zebra. He started following the zebra of status. He started following the zebra of, of, of worldly recognition. He started, he started following the zebra of identity in this world. He didn't follow the identity, the zebra, the pattern, the stripe of Christ. Focus, lest you find yourself following the wrong zebra the wrong status, the wrong stripe. You want to stay on mission? Focus your eyes on your identity in Christ. Number two, tune your ear, watch this now, to compassion and sacrifice. Tune your ear to compassion and sacrifice. Listen to the text. Jesus says, sell all that you have. And listen, listen, listen. We all get stuck right there. We, 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 we hear, that's the thing we hear above everything else. Sell all you have, take the proceeds, and give it to the poor. All thing we can hear is that first part, sell all you have. What? You want me to do what? You know what? <laughs> it's amazing how our ears can accommodate and get used to noise. So much so that we can't even hear it anymore. Growing up in Pearl, Mississippi, we lived right there by the airport. So 747s would commonly, regularly fly over our house. And we lived in a trailer. We lived in a mobile home, a double wide trailer. And we lived right there. And we were right in the pattern of the airport. So planes would fly over our trailer and <laughs> shake our little trailer all the time. Like we'd just be sitting there and all of a sudden, <laughs> the train just, I mean, not a, not a train, a plane, a plane, a plane, plane, 747 plane, although it felt like a train. Uh, so you got a plane flying over and the plane is loud as, <laughs> as loud and as crazy as it was for that plane to fly over us that felt like a train. <laughs> We didn't hear it anymore. We, I'm telling y'all, we did not hear it anymore. The only reason I remember that I was at, a, that we was living by airport, whenever we have company over, and we just talking, hanging out, <laughs> and a plane inevitably would fly over, and all of a sudden, the whole, <laughs> and we just be like, yeah, and our friends would be like, and they would be like freaking out and freaking out that nobody else was freaking out. So they'd be like, what is wrong with y'all? Don't y'all hear that? What is, what is wrong? And we was like, what? And we were like, oh, 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 the 747 that's literally rocking the foundation of the ground. Oh, that thing. Oh yeah, the airport's up the street. We just, we just got used to it. We, we got a, at our house right now, we got a toilet that's running. And we got one of the new toilets that's got the, you know, the, the, the double thing you push, not just a good old, Flush, you know what I mean? So it's got so I try to open it up and try to fix it. Well, it's still running. I gotta call a plumber tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I kind of forgot. Cause we didn't got used to that water just running, that we don't even hear it anymore. So Zoe or the kids walk in and say, What is that? What's up? Are y'all running water? We'd be like, Oh yeah, that's the toilet. I I just think what I guess what I'm trying to say is if you're not careful, if you're not intentional you will get used to ignoring sounds and voices. Sometimes I wonder if the compassionate voice of God is something that we've got used to ignoring. He says, sell all you have, but listen to the compassion. Take the proceeds and give it away to to those who are desperately in need. It's so funny, when you listen to the text, you think about a person who have means and you think, whoa, how painful. But imagine listening to that story, overhearing Jesus say that, and you're poor. Imagine how you read that passage if you're poor, if you don't have anything. He said, Jesus cares so much in this moment of this man's journey with him, he's thinking about me. He's thinking about the poor. He's thinking about the marginalized. And he's telling this rich young ruler, sell everything you have and give it to me. 
Give it to the poor. Do you hear the compassion? But also, you don't get compassion without sacrifice. That's why it's compassion. If, if compassion didn't require sacrifice, they wouldn't call it compassion. They'd call it Tuesday. Because it's just something that just comes every, on a regular basis. Now, this don't come right. Compassion requires sacrifice. But I fear we run the risk of getting off mission if we don't tune our ear to hear the compassionate voice of God and the sacrifice that he's calling us to make on a regular basis. He's always speaking to us concerning showing compassion to, the, to our neighbor. He's always speaking to us, inviting us to live sacrificially and extend compassion on a regular basis. But have we gotten so comfortable in our Christianity that we can't even hear the 747 of compassion hovering and shaking our lives, shaking our souls? Shaking the very foundation of the earth. Have we gotten so used to the 747 voice of God's compassion that we don't even hear it anymore? So they're poor, they're homeless, they're incarcerated, they're marginalized, they're, they're systemic injustice, and they're looking at us saying, you don't hear that, Christian? And we're saying, what? I, I don't even hear I've, I've gotten so used to it, I don't even hear it anymore. We've, it's, it's become easy to ignore his compassionate voice. You all know how you get off mission? Get comfortable with ignoring his compassionate voice. Tune your ear to compassion and sacrifice, not comfort and complacency. Oh, I wish I had a church in here with me today. Are y'all in here with me? Come on. I said, tune your ear to his compassion and sacrifice, not your comfort and complacency. May the volume of the 747 of compassion shake our souls once again. May it shake our hearts once again. May it shake the very foundation. May we be reminded that's what we're here for. It's our mission. It's who we be. Not a box that we check off and do once a year around Thanksgiving. Hold on to your mission. Hold on to your mission. Eyes focused on our identity in Christ. Ears tuned to his compassion and sacrifice. Third and finally, hands that are marked by generosity. Hands that are marked by generosity. You wanna hold on to your mission? Hold on. Make sure that you have hands that are marked by generosity. What does he say? What does he say? He says, sell it all and follow me. Well, the story says the man had great wealth. It's, it's almost a picture as if he has, he, he has stuff. Let me, let me grab this over here. It's, it's almost a picture. He's got, he's got a whole bunch of luggage. He got, the, he got luggage. He got all his luggage and he got all this stuff. It's a picture. And, and the picture is, he, he got so much stuff. He got so much stuff and, and he says, sell it all and follow me. And he's like, uh, but I got, and he's sad because his heart is exposed in the moment because the reality is he loves his stuff more than he loves his God. And he'd rather hold on to his stuff then follow Jesus empty-handed. Now, I'd imagine he was probably like, oh, in his mind, he's thinking, oh, no, Jesus, I don't have to get rid of my stuff. I got it packed in order for me to travel with it. I can travel with it. See, it's got rollers on it. I got handles. Oh, I'm prepared to follow you, Jesus, with all of my stuff. And Jesus says, that's the problem. You want to follow me with your stuff. And you don't follow me full of yourself. You follow me emptied of yourself. Friends, we don't follow Jesus full. You follow Jesus empty. And he was so full of himself. That he wasn't willing to empty himself so that he might be filled. He, he goes on at the end when they say, well, what about us? How are we going to do it? He says, listen, I'm going to fill you more, I'm, many times over. 
I'm going to fill you. You're going to follow me empty, but you ain't going to you ain't going to stay with me empty. You're going to follow me empty, but you're not going to stay with me empty. I'm going to fill you up. I'm going to pour back into you along the journey. Here, here's what he's saying. If you're going to stay on mission and fulfill the purpose that I have for your life, you got to have hands that are marked with generosity. Albert, what does that mean? Hands that beg the question, watch this. How much can I give away and not how much can I keep? That's the difference. That's the biggie. That's, 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 that's it. Your hand should be so marked with generosity that it begs the question, how much can I give, not how much can I keep? God is piercing your heart concerning giving of your time, talent, and treasure. The question shouldn't be, man, how much can I get away with without giving anything? No, the, your hand should be so marked with generosity. You should be saying, Lord, how much can I give? How much can I get? Can I give? I want to give away as much as possible. How much can I give? Not, I want to keep as much as possible. How little can I give? You see the mentality? You see the posture shift? You see the different thinking? One is one who's willing to try to do generosity. The other one is one is a mindset of one who's being generous. Concerning generosity, he doesn't call us to do generosity. He calls us to be generous. And being generous means I ask the question, how much can I give away? Not how much can I keep? If you want to stay on mission, friends, you want to hold on to this mission, focus your eyes on your identity in Christ, not the status of this world. Tune your ear to compassion and sacrifice, not comfort and complacency. And may your hands be marked with generosity. And may they beg the question, how much can I give away? Never. How much can I keep? Give myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I think more than anything else you need to hear, I love the verse that of this song where it says, my life is not my own. To you I belong. I give myself, I give myself to you. Hold on to the mission. Your life is not your own. To him we belong. So we focus our eyes, we tune our ears, we mark our hands, and we give ourselves away. And we do it all for his glory. Amen. I am. My life is not my own. Life is not my own, to you I belong, yeah, give myself, give myself to you, I give myself away, oh, oh, oh yes God, I give myself away, so you
I give it all. I give it all. I give it all. I give it all. Cause you gave it first. You gave it first. Give myself away. Give myself away. So you can use. God, that's our prayer today. God, that we can give ourselves away, Lord, for a beautiful reason so you can use us. God, I thank you for every sister, every brother that is watching right now in this moment, God, and I thank you that you see them and that you know them, God, and you want to use them. So God, I pray right now by the power of your Spirit that each and every single person can sense your leading and give themselves away so you, God, can use us because that's what you want to do. So God, we thank you for seeing us. God, we thank you for including us in your work. Let us get out of the way so you can do a great work. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God, it's just what an amazing, incredible, inspiring, challenging word. Um, yet again, Pastor Albert, we're so grateful for that. Um, you, as you're sitting, as you're watching today, uh, we want you to know that we as a team, we wanna connect with you. Uh, we are here to process, to hear how that imp message impacted you. So reach out to us right now, give us a talk call or send us a text. We'd love to connect with you. Another way that we would love to connect with you is through life groups. We know that we are not meant to do this life alone. We are meant to gather in community, even virtually, we're meant to gather in community. We can't live out these mandates that Jesus gives us that Pastor Albert so beautifully articulated to us. We can't do that alone. We need to gather in community. We need one another. So check out our website. Our team is ready and excited to help you find a life group so that you can find people and community to connect with. That's right. We don't want you to do life alone. And we as a church want to show up. There are many of us, many of you, that as we continue to go through this COVID season, we need help. We have kids at home. We've got jobs or we don't have jobs. Life is just getting so difficult. And we want you to know we as a church want to show up. So if you need help, let us know. We would love to connect with you. We would love to show up and be the church in your life right now. Well, that's right. And church, we just heard Pastor Albert challenge us to have hands that are marked by generosity. And right now we want to give you an opportunity to extend those hands of generosity uh, through worship, through giving. So if you look at the screen, you'll see all these different ways that there are to give today so that you can begin to practice the art of generosity, the worshipful act of generosity right now. That's right. And we want to not only right now connect with you, but all throughout the week, tomorrow, the day after, the next day, uh, we are here as a church community to engage every single day of the week. So check out opportunities. We would love to see you at each and every single one of them. Yeah. And one of the specific times that we want to connect with you is at our back to school bash coming up soon. We know uh, that so many of you have either started school or you're going to be starting school from preschool all the way up to college. And this year has looked so different than we ever could have imagined it would look. So we want to celebrate. We're just throwing a big old party uh, at our Huntington Drive campus. You can come and drive through. There'll be a DJ. There'll be giveaways. It'll be a great big time for us to celebrate uh, our going back to school drive through style. So good. Yeah, yeah. So good. And so with all of that, we just want to say thank you again for joining us. We're so thankful um, that you are with us. And we just want to pray a prayer of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you um, for all of our brothers and sisters across the nation, every city, wherever you are. May you feel the closeness and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And may that carry you throughout your week. We love you, Fellowship. Have a great week.